on the announcements. So uh, why don't we go to Psalm, I think it's Psalm 17, right? Is that where we're at, Psalm 17? Yeah. Oh, good. Excellent. Thank you. All right. So we can have, we can have a lot of readers today if we want. We could have, um, somebody's going to get stuck reading a big portion, but, um, well, we can do that. So why don't we do this? Psalm 17. Does everybody have Psalm 17? Who wants to read the first paragraph? Melissa? The second paragraph is nice and long. Who wants to read the second paragraph? Okay, Lisa? Who wants to read the third paragraph? Okay, that's, hey, no, it's, it's great. I love that you guys want to read. This is so good. Who wants to read the fourth paragraph and the one line for the fourth paragraph? Laura? Who wants to read the fifth? Dan? Okay. Uh, Marie, would you like to read the sixth one? That's a long one. Okay, you want to read. And who wants to finalize with just a few verses at the end? Okay. Jeannie, that's wonderful. Well, let's go. Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are upright. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and have found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress concerning the works of men by the word of your lips. I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Mm -hmm. Uphold my steps in your path, that my footsteps may not slip. I have called upon you, and you will hear me, O God. You will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me and hear my speech. Show your marvelous loving kindness by your right hand. O you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. From the wicked who oppose me, oppress me, sorry. From my daily, deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed up their fat hearts. Hmm. With their mouths they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes crouching down to the earth. As a lion is eager to tear his prey. And a young lion lurking in the secret places. Arise, O Lord, confront him. Cast him down. Deliver my life from the wicked with your sword. With your hand from men, O Lord. From men of the world who have their portion in this life, and whose belly you fill with your hidden treasure. They are satisfied with children, and leave the rest of their possession for their babies. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I wait in your likeness. Excellent job reading, guys. Good job. Beautiful psalms, don't you think? It's uh, really nice, and uh, it's got nice progressions in it, different different sections, and they're all broken up nicely. Let's see what. Let's see if Spurgeon hits this one uh, right. Uh, let your eyes look on the things that are upright. Believers do not desire any judge other than God to be excused from judgment or even to be judged on principles of partiality. Now, our hope does not lie in the prospect of favoritism from God and the consequent suspension of his law, we expect to be judged on the same principles as other men. And through the blood and righteousness of our Redeemer, we shall pass the ordeal unscathed. The Lord will weigh us in the scales of justice fairly uh, and justly. He will not false weights to permit us to escape. But with the sternest equity, those balances will be used on us as well as on others. With our blessed Lord Jesus, as our all in, we tremble not. For we shall not be found wanting. In David's case, he felt this cause to be so right that he simply desired the diving eyes to rest upon the matter, and he was confident that equity would have him all that he needed, would give him all that he needed. It's very legalistic terms that, you know, it, it's interesting because people say, oh, you know, you're, you're a lawyer and you're a pastor and... But, you know, the, the law and Scripture and, and, and many of the concepts that we have in Scripture are, are legally uh, based in a way. I mean, in, in God's law, right? Yes. I mean, you know, the Ten Commandments, right? God's law. So uh, Spurgeon is, is speaking like a lawyer here about the balances, about the upright, about being judged and a judge, being judged uh, uh, appropriately. Uh, you know, it, it, it raises an interesting thing. And I don't know if you realize what I did today in church. Let me ask this question to you. I did something very, very, very dynamic and very, very unusual that probably doesn't happen very often anywhere. 
can you, what do you think I did today? Oh, come on, you're not that perceptive. <laughs> it, it's so, it's, it, to be honest with you, it's, it's nothing, I've never done anything like that in 30, I've been preaching for over 30 years, and I've never done anything like that. I think the reading of that, making yourself be the, the man with the leper hand and, and doing that, that really touched that me. That was theatrical. I mean, that was, that was to make the sermon come alive. So that was just, that was what I would do on a trial. or That's something that I do all the time. It, it's effective, though. I mean, it's like, it's like in a summation, how I would try to summarize the, the trial that I was trying. I, you know, that would be theatrics. It's effective theatrics, but it's not. I did something today very, very deep spiritually that doesn't get done. Direct revelation. Well, okay. People read from Revelation. I've read from Revelation before. You don't, come on. I'll give you a clue. <clears throat> when we take communion, what do we do before we take communion? What do I always make you guys do before we take clear, Clean our hearts, clear our mind. Of, uh, examine ourselves. Examine ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. And by examining ourselves, what do we do? We judge ourselves. Okay. So now, we judge ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. And what's the effect of judging ourselves? It makes us right with God in order to take communion. Right. So what's the final result? What's the final result of that? Another drink. What does say? Um, what say? Damnation upon yourself. Judgment. So Judgment upon yourself. Yeah. I mean, look at. Does anybody so have? Many are sick. Set free from. So, so the process, look at the way to properly do communion, and it doesn't really get done, I, I, in my opinion, most churches don't do communion properly. Right. I think there's one directive to do communion, and the way to do communion is that before you take a, look at, if I don't do communion right, I'm putting all of you in sin, and it's my fault as the pastor, right? Mm -hmm. So my objective before I do, and if I don't have enough time, I'm not going to do it. My objective as the directives that the Apostle Paul gave the church are for to make sure that everybody in the congregation is right before God. Because if they're not right before God, then by taking communion, they bring judgment upon mm -hmm. themselves, right? So whatever we've done during the week, if we come to the table of the Lord and we say, Lord, forgive us, we're analyzing ourselves objectively, we're, we're thinking about what we've done, we're asking for forgiveness, right? And we're, we're, we're judging ourselves. And by doing that, we can take communion properly and then we won't be judged like the rest of the world because we judge ourselves. Mm -hmm. See, in the last portion of the scripture says, if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. Right? Yeah, you follow me on this? Amen. Okay, now knowing all that, do you know what I did today? Go ahead. You matched um, with judging ourselves first to the theme of the psalm where uh, the psalmist judged himself first and said he, uh, that his request was not coming from deceitful lips. Okay, you're, you're right on that, Lisa, but I'm setting that aside. I'm asking you, what did I do in service that was so dramatic today? That's I've never done before in 30 years. You don't know? Here's what I did that pastors don't do. Go ahead. I thought maybe you were, t you were verbalizing that you also were judging yourself, besides us judging ourselves. No, no, I'll tell you what it is. When I got up to the podium and I read the second chapter of Revelation, what, what, what church was that to? Does anybody remember what church that was? Ephesus. Ephesus. Yeah. Okay. It was to Ephesus. And Ephesus was a very good church, a very strong church, a very a church that persevered, a church that didn't let in any heresy. It was solid theologically. It was a good church, solid church. I mean, the Ephesian church was good, right? But they lost their first love. I pronounced judgment on this church today as the pastor. I pronounced judgment on my own church. And why? Because it's the right thing to do. Oh. And very few pastors, you'll never see it. I, I would say this. You'll never see a pastor pass judgment on his own church unless he's frustrated with the church, unless they're firing him. I'm talking about in a loving way, being led by the Lord. Because I'm in a prayer meeting yesterday, and the Lord came upon me as we were praying and said, you know, pronounce the judgment that's found in, in Revelation chapter 2, the church of Ephesus. I did what the Lord said. We've lost our first love. You know, it's a tremendous church, and it was a tremendous thing to do, and nobody noticed it. I pronounced judgment on my own church. Why? Because if, and then the communion confirmed it, that if I don't judge, if we don't judge ourselves, we'll fall into judgment. 
But if we judge ourselves, we'll be elevated by God. It's a very, very unique thing. I'm going to have to celebrate on that all week long because I think it's something very special. And I think something things like that have to happen before renewal comes to a church. Mm-hmm. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to say something. Um, with us judging ourselves, if, if you're taking communion and you're only focusing on yourself and the things that you've done, but you're not realizing that Jesus is right there while you're taking communion. You know, that you're only doing part of it. You have to you have to judge yourselves, but you also have to realize Jesus is there with us. Yeah, I mean I mean there's no I mean that's the first love is knowing that he's there with us. I mean I think that we have to realize that we're his creation and we owe, we owe everything to him and our life revolves around Christ, like Christ is the center. And when the churches forget about that, they become lukewarm, they get so, con- they get so concerned with programs and doing, then they forget about the true essence of Christ. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so that was very, that was a very, that's something that is kind of like a, a milepost in the life of the church. So uh, anyway. Food Thank you for sharing. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's I, I, I thought more people would know. All right, so uh, let's kind of, uh, any comments before I get into anything? Do you want to comment on Psalm 17? Anybody want to comment? I mean, it was, it was a beautiful psalm. You can come on in if you'd like. You're, you're welcome. How you doing? How you doing? What's your name? Thomas. James? Thomas, you may have a seat. We're just awesome. in the middle class. You can uh, just uh, Thank you. Partake, and you'll you'll catch on quickly. Okay. So we're we're just we're just talking about Psalm 17 before we get into the lecture um, and, and the class. But any thoughts on Psalm 17, Lisa? It's like a model uh, on how to pray. And uh, good. In thinking of that, it goes back to where you often say in the sermon that most people pray of the of the McDonald's prayer, which yeah. is oh, the Lord. They, they don't um, do a prayer often, but Lord, I want this. Amen. And here. Yeah. Uh, he examines himself, his judgment of not only on himself, but also on the other side. Of yeah. He's Good. Against, and then um, knows that the Lord will do the right thing. Yeah, you, actually your comment before now about what you were talking about is, is really, now that we've unpacked that, it's a beautiful comment you made before. So, uh, yes, true. Anything else, John? David was absolutely There was another sure. packet there. Is, did somebody take the packet that was there? We had an extra packet here. Uh, you, Frank, you can't take one every week. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Melissa, can you get that packet for me, for 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 John? That way, Frank takes one every week. <laughs> Sorry, Frank. <laughs> Thanks, Melissa. <laughs> Somebody's never had one before, though. Maybe we'll give it to John. John, here's the packet of materials, John. And, and you're welcome to go through that. We'll, after class, we can tell you where you're at uh, with everything. Thank you, uh, Frank. Pay attention. You're good. Good. All right. All right, so uh, any other comments? Thank you, Melissa. Thank you for doing the dirty work. <laughs> what other comments? Because I have, a, I have a big surprise for you today. I'm so excited. I know. I can see. I'm so excited. What are you laughing about? <laughs> you're you're going to be laughing in a minute. Yeah. I'm all excited for <laughs> yeah. the surprise. I'm all excited. Oh, you're going to be very excited for the surprise. Yeah, I like hearing where he says you've tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and found nothing. May show John where we were at so that he can follow along with us. Thanks, I, I, I believe that he goes along with what we did with communion, with judging ourselves. Yeah. As we judge ourselves, God judges our hearts, and he sees that we're, we're trying to be together. But it's a bold act. Yeah. It's a bold act. Mm-hmm. It's a bold act to judge yourself. It's a bold act to judge the church. Yeah. But I think if more pastors were bold enough to judge the church, look, we're not perfect, but we're, you know, we're, we're doing our best. You know, and, and it's a good place. It's a good place to be. Amen. Yeah. Pastor John, uh, David was absolutely, without a doubt, convinced that if God, if God judged him directly. For what he did, mm-hmm. that he would be vindicated. Hmm. Hmm. Well, it's interesting that when we judge ourselves and we're and we're honest before God and we ask for forgiveness, you know, it, Spurgeon said it very good here. Didn't he say, uh, "We will not be found wanting"? Mm-hmm. Uh, also, it says, "Because of our Redeemer, we shall pass the ordeal unscathed." Amen. I mean, so it, look at this. Is not this is. 
not Galatians where we have a right to sin, but if we do sin, he's able to forgive, right? So that's good, good, good points. Any other points? Laura? Um, where it says they have closed up their fat hearts. Is that maybe like they have no remorse? Yeah, like, where, where they could have went to the Crystal Diner, I'm not sure. But yeah. <laughs> I mean, not wanting to change their ways, because it yeah. says it says next yeah. that with their mouth they speak proudly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's a good point. I definitely think that the words. I mean, I don't know what translation this is, uh, but um, they have closed up their fat hearts. It's certainly not uh, a, not a flattering statement, right? Yeah. I mean, so it's 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 it's. It's a, a gluttonous statement, a, a statement of uh, overindulgence. It's not good. So, uh, so if they have fat hearts, to me, it's telling me it's it's not a good heart. Right. Yeah. If my Bible says callous. Callous. callous yeah. Callous yeah. Hard. That, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Hard. Right. Good. Yeah. Good. Good. Anything else, guys? All right. Well, time for fun. All right, what do I have here? A quiz. Let's see what we have here. Oh, no, it's not a quiz. A quiz would be too easy. Oh. Yeah. Don't worry about that, John. John. John has nothing to worry about. Worse than a quiz? Oh, this is worse than a quiz. This is very difficult. Very, very. Now, guys. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, it's just, uh, you know, it's only two pieces, a couple pieces of paper. It shouldn't worry too much. That's why you're laughing. No, I, I, I took my own test and failed it, so I, so I don't know if there's much hope. All right. So, so here's the good news with everything, guys. Oh, no, no. Here's the good news with this. You're not going to take this test now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. No, 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 no. There, there, well, there's a few things. Look at. First of all, first of all, it's a very difficult test. Did you guys get it back there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. So here's the deal. It, it's very difficult, uh, and, and I made it difficult on purpose. So here's here's how you can do it. We're not going to do it now. I'm not going to put everybody on the spot to do something like that because it would take too long. You can either. You can take it home and open your Bible and do the test, okay? Which is, it's harder in itself doing it that way. If you really want to try to force yourself to really challenge yourself, I would take the test without opening up the Bible. And, you know, look, it, it's, it's not going to be, it's going to be very difficult. Mm. But the questions, a lot of the questions are kind of open-ended a little bit, so you can, you, you can, you know, put some information in there. And if it's close, you know, you're going to get credit for it. Um, now, the way to take the test, if you're going to take the test and you're going to open your Bible, it, it goes, it's in a progression. It goes from chapter 1 all the way to chapter 13. So if I were taking this test and I had my Bible open, I would just, I'd read all the questions first, go through all the questions first, and then I would open up my Bible and start reading Hebrews chapter 1. And as I'm reading Hebrews chapter 1, I'll look at the questions to see, if I can answer any, any questions from Hebrews chapter 1 and then do that through the whole uh, book. Now, if you really want to be, if you really want to challenge yourself, do it without the Bible, you're going you're, you're to be very, you, you're, you think that you're going to be very disappointed with yourself because there's going to be a lot of the answers that you got <coughs> wrong. There's going to be a lot of um, questions that, you know, you don't know the answer to or you put down the wrong thing. But, it, you know, I think it's better to try to, I think it's good to try to challenge yourself first to see if you can answer any questions without the Bible. Hmm. And then, once you get through answering the questions without the Bible, then you can go back and you can go through it with the Bible and then really learn it all, and pretty much you'll get, you'll get most of the answers right. So it's just really, it's a learning exercise for you, but it's definitely a challenging. If I was, at, you know, if I was teaching a graduate course, this is, the, this is the final exam they would get. You know, it's a tough, it's a tough final exam. You know, and then the, the last one, I, we, we, we didn't type it up really, we didn't type it up so good. Uh, what did I do? Put it, okay, let me just see here. I think the last question, I there's some typographical errors in the last one. But, um, you know, there's, um, let me just see here. You didn't, get, you didn't get my answers, did you? I didn't give you the answers. <laughs> I gave out answers the is other George, day. Is George here? <laughs> yeah, I know, right? I don't want to give you the answers. Because I actually had all the citations for each question, like the citations for the answers and all that, but I took them I took them off because that would be too easy. You know, so, so what's the return date on this? 
No, no, I mean, we just we want to get it done by the last class, right? Mm -hmm. That way we can kind of go over it together. and uh, But it, it, it captures really everything. So we're not turning it in? Uh, I don't know yet. i got to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, look, I, I, you're gonna self, you're gonna self grade. You guys are gonna self grade your own. You're gonna self grade. Okay, sure. Now, if, if a person in here want is gonna do it without the Bible, they get a different curve. Like you know, they get a totally different curve. Like the person that does it without the Bible, in all likelihood, is probably gonna get the highest grade. Right. Just the way it works. You know, so that would be the highest grade. And, you know, the highest. If people do it without the Bible at all that's probably going to be the highest grades. And then the people with the Bible, then you could see how well you did with it. How about if we do one without the Bible and write it all down, and the second one that we can compare to? You can do whatever you like if you want to do that. Yeah, Pastor Ross wants to know, is there any extra credit? <laughs> well, I, I'm going to tell you this. Yeah, good question. I want to, you know what, you can, you can, what, what you can do if for extra credit, that'll be like a lot of points. The extra credit, here's the extra cre credit question, because you're definitely going to, now look, at here's the way I grade, just so you know, like, if you get 50% right, you get an A. I mean, I make, like, like, this would be odd, because if I was at Princeton teaching, this would be, the, 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 this is how I, so I would make the test extremely, extremely hard. But the grading scale is really, easy, you know, really beneficial to you. So then it just, then it just goes, then it just goes down, you know, goes down, it goes down from there. And then fail is less. It's less less than fifteen, I'd say. But but I do that because I'd rather I'd rather you be challenged and get the wrong answer, but think about it, than have some stupid answer that's easy. To, that's easy. That, that, that's not learning. I mean, I like the tests that are brutally hard. And and, and this is it, this test is brutally hard. It doesn't look at Pentha Rob, but it is. When I was in St. Joe's, we also had an E. Did we get an E in there? <laughs> well, yeah. for effort, I want to feel up. How about, how about I'll tell you what, I'll give you this. I'll give you this. If, no, if, he's above us. Uh, here's, here's what I'll do. I'm, for past Rob, I'm gonna make it, I'm gonna make a correction. So anything less than the D, how's this guys? I'm, I'm making if, as long as you try, you get an E for effort. How's that, Pastor Rob? Like that's that's, that's, that's Pastor Rob's grade. E for effort. What a distinction. Yeah. But but this is it's fun. It's gonna be fun for you. And even 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 John has missed all the classes, but he can take that test. He can take his Bible, Thomas. and he can, Thomas. Yeah. He can take his Bible, and he can try to answer the questions, right? And he gets at least an E for effort. He may surprise himself, you know. So, uh, so that's what. Uh, so, okay, the extra credit. What do you think the extra credit is going to be? What do you, can anybody figure out what the extra credit question is going to be? It's so obvious. Nobody knows. No. Oh, come on. Explain. You. <laughs> this is so easy, guys. Explain in your own words what once for all means. That's extra credit. That's number, That's number two. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's on there. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought I, I thought I kind of didn't put it on there as clear. Yeah. Oh man, she put it on there. I told her. Put, I told her to make that extra credit. Okay. All right. You can still make twenty-two extra credit. There you go. What what question is it? Twenty-two. 22. Yes. I must. She must have gave me the wrong uh, citation then. It says explain the ones for all concepts. Ah man. Okay, that's your extra credit. So that's like, this will be worth like 10 times every other question. So you technically, if you can explain that right, you're going you're gonna to bump yourself up. You, you won't be in danger of, uh, you, you'll, be, you'll be already there. You'll be already, well, if you get that right, you'll be already there. Okay. That's, that's the whole thing I want you to learn. All righty. Let me see here. She gave me the wrong one. Anyway, all right, so that's good. All right, so that's all done with. All right, so let's get into uh, Hebrews. Any other questions about that or no? What do you think you're going to do? You're going to try to do it without or with? Without. Without. without good. Yeah. Wow, that's good. I like that. With. with? Yeah, that's fine. Well, you're 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 allowed to do it with. Yeah, it is. <laughs> All right, good test? All right, hopefully uh, you'll do well with it. It's got all the concepts that we talked about, and uh, as long as you get it in the area, you, you'll get a credit for it. You know, I'm, I'm a pretty easy grader. 
Um, all right, let's read Hebrews chapter 10 and Hebrews chapter 11. So uh, here's what I think we'll do. Why doesn't everybody read one verse, right? And we'll just lap it a few times. How's that sound, everybody? Is that good? Why, why don't we start with Mitch first? That way Thomas could figure out what we're doing. So you, you caught up? Okay. So we're start with 10. So we're going to start with 10. And why don't we talk? Exactly. So then here's what we'll do, Mitch. Since he's all caught up and he, he, he's there, Good. we'll start with Thomas. Okay. Thomas, you're just going to read one, one verse. Right. And then Mitch will read another verse, Jeannie, and then we'll go around the room. If you want to read, you read. If you don't want to read, you just say pass. No problem. All right? And then we'll just keep on reading until we get chapter 10 and chapter 11 done because we're going to do that. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do it. Okay, so Thomas, begin. Christ sacrifice once for all. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the rel relatives, relatives themselves. For this reason, it can never, it can never, by the, sa by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. If it could, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all. <laughs> And would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. <laughs> he, he liked that, didn't he? He liked reading that. You know? He got lucky he got the once for all. When he saw that, he just his eyes lit up and he's like, I got it all. I got the best verse in the whole portion of scripture. Mitch is excited. Jeannie, but verse those, three. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. Because it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. We're having too much fun in this class. We're having too much fun learning theology and learning scripture. You know, it, 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 sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering he did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, O oh God. First he said, Sacrifice, sacrifices and offering, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you do not desire, nor were you pleased with them, although the law requires them to be made. Then he said, Here I am, I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first to establish the second. And by that will, <clears throat> we have been made holy through the sacrifice of the bo body of Jesus Christ once and for all. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when his, this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Since that time, he waits for his enemy to be made <laughs> Okay, so we'll go we'll go back to Thomas. Uh, Thomas, verse fourteen. Verse fourteen. Because by one sac sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, "This is the covenant I will make with them after that time," says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds. Their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. <laughs> and where these have been forgiven, there is no more any sacrifice for sin. Therefore, brothers, <clears throat> since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to ho <clears throat> the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, 
as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, <coughs> and all the more as you see the day approaching. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we have received the knowledge of truth, no sacrifice for sin is left. Thomas 27. 27. But only a fearful expectation, expectation of judgment and a raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Anyone who rejected the law of Moses died without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much more severely do you think a man deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who has treated as an unholy thing the blood of the covenant that sanctified him, and who has insulted the spirit of grace. For we know him who said, It is mine to avenge, I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. Remember those earlier days, after you had received the light, when you stood your ground, in the great contest in the face of suffering. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. <clears throat> At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. You sympathize with those in prison and joyfully accept the confiscations of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to preserve, I'm sorry, you need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he had promised. For in just a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. <clears throat> but we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and have faith. By faith, number 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command, so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. By faith, Abel offered God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as a righteous man. When God spoke well of his offerings, and by faith, he still speaks, even though he is dead. By faith, Enoch was taken from this life, though he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. For before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please God, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. By faith, Noah, when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham when called to go to the place he would later receive as an inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, and Sarah herself was there and was enabled to become a father because he considered himself faithful, who <coughs> had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were looking for a better country, a heavenly one. 
Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham raised that father <coughs> raised the dead, and freely through speaking, he did receive Isaac back from the dead. By faith, Isaac left Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he died, blessed each of Joseph's, jo Joseph's sons and worshiped as he led on the top, leaned on top of the staff. By faith, Joseph, when his end was near, spoke about the exodus of the Israelites from Egypt and gave instructions about his bones. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months after he was born because they saw he was no ordinary child, and they were not afraid of the king of the sea. By faith, Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God, rather than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a short time. He regarded his faith in the place of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt, because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He preserved because he saw him who is, who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, so that the destroyer of the firstborn would not touch the firstborn of Israel. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land, but when the Egyptians tried to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people had marched around them for seven days. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed by those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time <coughs> to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jacob, David, Samuel, and the prophets. Who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised. Who shut the mouths of lions. Quenched the fury of flames, and escaped the edge of the sword. Whose weakness was turned to strength. And who became powerful in battle, and rooted foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Others were tortured and refused to be released, so that they may gain a better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging, while still others were chained and put in prison. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they were put mm -hmm. to death by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, and in caves and holes in the ground. These were all commended for their faith, yet none of them received what had been promised. God had planned something better for us, so that only together with us would they be made perfect. Very good, guys. Okay. <clears throat> I don't have a lot of time, so I'm not going to rush through this, but here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go through chapter 11 very quickly here, because we've it, there's, there's not really a lot to unpack there other than factually. But it's an interesting thing. If you look Look to where chapter 11 begins and see where it says by faith and then it says chapter it says 11. These are all put in by the scholars and the theologians. They put these breaks in and these titles in. So they're always non-canonical. The Bible wasn't written that way originally, right? So here's a good example that we haven't seen yet so far where if you go to verse 38 and 39, you can almost have verse 38 and 39 really would be in chapter 11. They just, they made the break because in verse 38, they begin to talk about faith, right? I see if you follow what I'm saying. No. It says, but my righteousness, one will live by faith. And if he shrinks back, I will not be pleased with him. But we're not those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who believe and are saved. So there's where, that's the introduction to the theme of faith. 
which is really the theme of chapter 11, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So what I'm showing you is an example of where they broke it probably in the wrong spot. That's just the, the you know, the editors and whoever's, you know, putting together whatever translation is. But I would have, if I was writing this, I would have started chapter 11 with, but my righteousness, one will live by faith. And then that would be verse 1. Verse 39 would be verse 2. And then verse 1 in 11 would be 3. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes. I don't want to confuse you. But it was just, it's just a theological example of when they break these things the wrong way. Uh, man does that. That's not God doing that, right? Because it's all written just together. You know, it's not broken into uh, in, into the way it is here. But what I want to show is that we have the definition. The, the definition of faith is Hebrews chapter eleven. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So that's the definition of faith, verse one in eleven, right? Then it goes into I counted, and you can do this on your own. I counted twenty five examples of faith. They go with, first, that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So that really is for us, right? The first one I would say is for us that we understand and believe these things because we have faith, right? So let's put us in as number one. Then the second person mentioned would be Abel, right? In verse four, right? Abel. Verse five is Enoch. Then verse six is the directive that it is impossible to please God without faith. That's the directive, right? Then we get to Noah in verse 7, is commended for his faith. Then Abraham is commended for faith more than anybody else in the Bible. Yeah. There's probably five or six times. Verse 8, Abraham's commended for his faith. Verse 9, he's commended, where he mentions Isaac and Jacob. Verse 11, he's commended. Verse 12, he's commended. Verse 17, he's commended, right? Mm -hmm. Verse 19, he's commended. Then in verse 20, it's Isaac, Jacob, and Esau who are commended for faith, right? By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. So I guess the argument would be that Isaac is blessed for his faith and not Jacob and Esau. Then by faith, Jacob, verse 21, Joseph is blessed, right? Then Moses' parents are blessed. Then Moses is blessed. Then in verse 29, I know I'm going fast, I'll go back over this next week. Verse 29 says, the people were blessed because they passed through the Red Sea, they had faith to walk into the water, right? Then the walls of Jericho fell, that's 15. Verse 31, Rahab is commended for her faith, right, in verse 31. Then you have a potpourri in verse 32. You have Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, David, Samuel, and then the prophets. So you have a lot of people in verse 32 commended for their faith. And then... Verse 35, women are commended for their faith. They receive back their dead, right? Then you have, in verse 35, others are commended that faced martyred, that, that were martyred. So you have about 25 people, groups of people, people that are commended for their faith. So Hebrews chapter 11 is all about faith. And then there's just examples of faith, and when the people receive the faith, what happened thereafter? You follow me? I'll finish up first, uh, I'll finish up chapter 10 next week. And then if you have any questions on chapter 11, you can go through, but you can diagram out chapter 11. Pastor, I'm sorry, it's all yours. Yes, very. We had a very good class. Thank you. They were always good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Today was very good. They got a test. Yeah. Made me happy. Yes, I <laughs> Thank you, Pastor. Makes me, makes me happy when they give it, get a test. Uh, Pastor <laughs> Thomas, he's new to the class. Hey, Thomas, welcome. And so uh, he's very doing very well. All right, everybody, good, good job. I'm sorry I went very fast today, uh, but uh, we'll pick it up next week, and then we have a few more. So basically, the review is what you have in your hand, and we'll we'll go over that. So good luck with that. It's, it's not an easy. I didn't take it easy on you, so I'll I'll be interested to see how you do with it and how you respond to it. Uh, uh, Pastor, here's the test, but I'm going to give you I'm going to give you the answer key. Oh, okay. So how's that? So I'm going to give you the test and give you the answer key. Uh, don't feel bad. I failed my own test. Okay. George, George isn't here, so he doesn't get the answer. Oh, uh, yeah, George doesn't bucks. get the answer. fifty bucks. I said twenty, but fifty. Okay. I would have said a hundred. You're selling it cheap. <laughs> Welcome, Pastor. Uh, how are you doing, everyone? Good. Thank you. Blessed. Uh, in Hosea, uh, we may pick up from uh, and that's gonna
see, the mark of the good test is when, when the test taker takes it and says, did I ask this? You know, that's it. We all go through that. We all go through that. Uh, I want to pick this up in chapter 9. We can. I want to get through chapter nine and part of chapter ten uh, today. I want, I'm going to ask you a, a very, very disturbing question. It's only it's only disturbing because a lot of people don't understand what's behind the question. So we'll have some fun with it. Okay. Does God have the right to wage holy war? I see one yes. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So. All right, why? Why do you say? Why are you saying yes? Because he's God. He, he's, he's our maker. He's all sovereign. He's every right to judge us. Okay. <laughs> See, in, in this culture, as soon as you say holy war, we think of jihad, which is the, you know, the Arab uh, uh, concept. If you, you know, if you don't think like me, you're gone. You know, I mean, that's yeah. that's what holy war yeah. is. But uh, the Bible, the theme of holy war, continues right from Genesis to Revelation, and it's important. I think that you, you pick up on that theme because do I do it can I write on the board? Of course not. Yes. Yes. Okay. Let me go ahead and go through this with you. Uh, and make sure it's not a permanent one. Yeah, it's whiteboard. I made that yeah. mistake one time. <laughs> so does Rob. <laughs> This is a uh, present evil age that we're in, okay? Oh. I write in Italian. <laughs> All right. This is the second coming of Christ. This whole thing of holy war is very simple, and it evolves around the concept of who's directing the universe? God. 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 And what's his goal? What's his goal? To get back to Eden. Yeah. His goal. His goal. His goal is always restoration, right? Now, what happens if people block that progress that God is making? He'll destroy them. He has to intervene. He has to intervene. Yeah. Right? You're ultimately right, right Marie. But before he, inter uh, as he intervenes, he usually sends what? Prophet. Well, yes. Prophet. You know, to, to prophet. And most of the times we all know that they didn't listen to the prophet. No, they killed him. <laughs> they killed him, right? They killed him. So we have this present evil age. Also, when we trust Christ, we have eternal life, right? Yeah, hallelujah. So the struggle for us as believers is we live between two ages right now, right? We have a, we have a, the moment we believe we, our citizenship is in heaven, yes, sir. yet we live in the present evil age. Yes, we do. Make sense? Yeah. That's, uh, that's Romans chapter 7, by the way, uh, where Paul says, the things I know I should do, I don't. The things I, I do do, I know yeah. I shouldn't do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's Who that struggle. Who can deliver me? I'm sorry? Who can yeah. deliver me? A wretch like yeah, me, he I says, know. right? Yep. Who can deliver a wretch? Only Jesus can do that. But God will wage holy war on anyone who chooses not to repent and stand in his way. Amen. Including his own people. Yeah. That's right. Did you ever think of that? Sure. Right? What? Well, yes? Would you say that again, please? Yeah. God, God will wage holy war. God will wage holy war on those who try to 
block his uh, progress, if I can put it that way. Um, and he will do that even against his own people. But remember, prior to that, he gives ample warning. Oh, yes. Right? Through prophets, right? Yeah. Uh, look at Noah, right? 120 years. Yeah. I mean, that, it's longer than most of us live. Right? Yeah. Uh, so he gives ample warning, but it comes, and only God knows the cutoff, if I could put it that way. When, when it's necessary now for him to wage holy war. You know, with Israel, how did he how did he do it in Israel? We're going to see it in here. How do we how did he do it in Israel? Who who did God use to bring judgment to Israel? Nebuchadnezzar. I'm sorry. Nebuchadnezzar. All right. Well, particularly the Assyrians. Right. Right. And the Babylonians. Right. The Assyrians attacked the North Kingdom. The Babylonians attacked the South Kingdom. And so they were taken captive. They were taken captive. All right? I mean, there's a lot of ramifications to, uh, to this. And, and again, I, uh, you know, we'll talk more about this at the end of Hosea. But uh, Nebuchadnezzar is a good example of, of this because with uh, uh, Daniel, right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which was not their real names. No, right? they didn't change their names. I want you to understand this. God permitted the Babylonians to come in. And not only did they come in and take captive the Jews, but the king tried to change who they were. Who was the first thing he did? Change their name. Yeah. The next thing, he changed their education. The next thing, he tried to change their diet. Right? I mean, these these are all tools of... Uh, Not to mention that he castrated them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tool, tools of indoctrination. That makes my knees buckle. I'm sorry. I'd say, yeah. <laughs> he, was, he took away their identity, and that yeah. even happens today. You know, they take... Like when you go in the military, they shave your hair. Yeah. Because it takes away your identity. Right. And your identity is everything. Yep. Yeah. Um, yes. Look what's happening now. Yeah. Men are being changed, women to men, men to women. Okay. The change in the food, that's happening now. It's happening yeah. Right now. Yeah, sure is, isn't it? I And we need to be aware of this, you know, and again, not to get political, but I think we're in a nation now that is so far away from where God wants us that we we better be careful. <laughs> you know, and we really better be careful in, in, in all of this. Um, this... This whole concept goes right through the last battle. Yes, sir. Doesn't it? Yeah. It goes right through the last battle. When did the battle start? You're talking about Armageddon. Genesis no, no. 3.15. Genesis 3.15. Yeah, absolutely. Right? That's when the battle started. Yeah. Right? Imagine. What was the penalty for that battle? Banishment. 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 But in the banishment, God in his grace gave the solution, right? Yes, it did. And that was his son. So we, we have to look at both ends of this, you know, in order to do justice to it. That's why, you know, I, I will say to people, no matter what happens economically, politically, uh, and culturally, if we retain who we are in Christ, our identity, right? We're going to be okay. We will be okay. I can't emphasize that enough. How did Israel in Hosea lose its identity? How did they do that? Adultery. Unbelief. Unbelief? Yeah. Who did they look to for their identity? Egypt, Assyrians, uh, whoever, whoever they thought that they yeah. could get. Yeah. Anyone but God. Anyone but God. Right. Right. Anyone but God. That's, that's really the ens essence of spiritual adultery. It really is, right? I can't, I can't tell you that our identity in, uh, in God, in Christ, is so important. If, if there is a way we can impress that on our young people, 
then they wouldn't get caught up in that, you know, you're judged by your beauty, how thin you are, you know, uh, your hair, your money, or anything like that. No, our, thought, our, our identity is secure in Christ. We are Christ followers. And you listen, everybody wants to be liked by someone, but if somebody doesn't like that identity, then they're really not a friend, all right? Again. And that's the only way to our ultimate victory. Yeah. We are in our ultimate victory that with our identity in Christ. Our identity, not in Christ, will bring us to a bad place. Right. Right. It always will. Well, that's the world. That's the world. Yes. <laughs> that's you either world. choose Christ or the world. Exactly. There's yeah. no in-between. That's why we go through things in our life, because he's shaping us and breaking us and molding us into how he wants us to be and, and, and for him. You're absolutely right. Yeah. You're absolutely right. There is a caveat to that, if we let him. That's right. Right, if we let him. We have to allow him to do that. Why don't we go to chapter 9? Can I have somebody? John, maybe we can start with you, if you don't sure. mind. And let's go. Why don't you do the first uh, five verses? And then we'll go down to the next five. Mitch, next five. Do you mind reading that one? All right. And then the next five. You got 17. Yeah, I'm going to leave those two intentionally right there. All right. Okay. Do not rejoice over Israel. Do not be jubilant like the other nations, for you have been unfaithful to your God. You love the wages of a prostitute at every threshing floor. Threshing floors and wine presses will not feed the people. The new wine will fail them. They will not remain in the Lord's land. Ephraim will return to Egypt and eat unclean food in Assyria. They will not pour out wine offerings to the Lord, nor will their sacrifices please him. Such sacrifices will be to them like the bread of mourners. All who eat them will be unclean. This food will be for themselves. It will not come into the temple of the Lord. What will you do on the day of your appointed feasts, on the festival days of the Lord? Even if they escape from destruction. Wait, wait, give Jeannie a chance. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Excuse me. Even if they escape from destruction, Egypt will gather them, and Memphis will bury them. Their treasures of silver will be taken over by briars, and thorns will overrun their tents. The days of punishment are coming. The days of reckoning are at hand. Let Israel know this. Because your sins are so many and your hostility is so great, the prophet is considered a fool, the inspired man a maniac. The prophet, along with my God, is the watchman over Ephraim, yet snares await him on all his paths and hostility in the house of his God. They have sunk deep into corruption as in the days of Eba. God will remember their wickedness and punish them for their sins. When I found Israel, it was like finding grapes in the desert. When I saw your fathers, it was like seeing the early fruit on the fig tree. But when they came to Baal, pure, they consecrated themselves to that shameful idol and became as vile as the thing they loved. So now, <laughs> a, a frame's glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Even if they rear children, I will bereave them of everyone. Woe to them when I turn away from them. I have seen Ephraim, like Tyre, planted in a pleasant place. But Ephraim will bring out their children to the slayer. Give them, O Lord, what will you give them? Give them wounds that miscarry and breasts that are dry because of all their wickedness in Gilgal, I hated them there. Because of their sinful deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will no longer love them. All their leaders are rebellious. Whoa! Yeah. Right? That's... Uh, I'm done. Yeah, you're done. <laughs> so, so is Israel. <laughs> I think he's serious. You think he's serious? <laughs> and what did, tell me what things you picked up here in that. There's a lot here. I, you know, I think well, there is a lot here. In verse 15, he says of their wickedness, like in Gilgal, 
He's talking about when he, when he took Saul out. That's where Saul was killed. Yeah. That's the first king. You yeah. Know? So it doesn't get more drastic than that. You know, he took Saul out. You know, it wasn't the Philistines. God, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> that's why David never would harm him. That's David right. had the chance to, to, to kill him twice, at least twice that we yeah. know of. And he said, I, I will not. I will not touch God's anointing. That's your. That's his job. That's he right. will do that. He'll take Saul out. That's right. Dana, then I'll get to Mitch. I, I'm curious about the first part. It says, do not rejoice, so Israel will not be jubilant. So he's telling them, you have nothing to be cheerful about. That's the first part. Yeah. Then the last chapter. Yeah, remember in the last chapter, um, in, in their rebellion against God, they were getting drunk. The leaders mm -hmm. were getting drunk. They were celebrating, right? Rob? Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah, I just, I thought that was interesting that this starts off with, like, well, don't really care about me, nothing to care about. Yeah, I mean, to me, what brought to mind for me was, listen, live for today, right? Uh, party, this is all we got. This is all, and, when, when, and that mentality, I hate to say it, is pervasive today. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Rob? Well, it's, it's interesting. Yeah. If you continue on in that verse, it says, for I have been unfaithful, for you have been unfaithful to your God. You love the wages of a prostitute at every threshing floor. So they were willing to sell themselves for anything and everything. That's right. And not necessarily monetarily, just pleasure, whatever. Yeah. Whatever it is to be. Like you said, you know, it's. Yeah, you're right. It feels good. It's right, kind of attitude. You know what I mean? Yeah. For for, if I can put it this way, for a, mom, a moment of pleasure. Yeah. Right, Mary. And and doesn't it say in the in the Bible it warns us not to rejoice when our enemies fall? That's right. That's right. Because it's a scary thing if we do that, then God will put on us the same judgment. We forget that, though, don't we? We forget. Uh, Dana, did you have another question? No. Okay. Yes. So they were willing to sell their, their souls to the yeah. devil, yeah. basically, really, for, yeah. for uh, fleeting pleasures. Yeah, for fleeting pleasures. Can we do this as believers? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Happens Excellent. all the time, right? Excellent. Happens Excellent. all the time. This should really be a warning for us, the church, correct? Because we, we can fall into spiritual uh, adultery easily. Right? We're one step away, every one of us, yes. It seems to me, anyways, that this takes us all the way through the end of the Bible. Verse 11 talks about no birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Right. I think about the pregnant woman in Revelation, that they're not going to be part of that. They're cast out. Yeah, yeah. I would suggest to you, you, you kind of gave away what I was going to do. Um, that's okay. yeah. <laughs> I would suggest to you that what you're seeing here uh, is, is the beginning of God's holy war against his people. Mm. Right? Infertility, not only in the land, but physically for, for people, right? Jan. And verse 3, I see God telling them, if you keep this up, you're going to Assyria. Yes. Yeah. He's letting them know. Where they're going, the northern child of Israel, is is, is a prophecy, and it goes all the way through to the end of the chapter. God is telling him exactly, you keep this up. This is what I have in store for you. This is what's going to happen. And they didn't hear him. They didn't listen. And what's a stumbling block for many people, Bible students, is that God will use evil people, yeah, to bring judgment mm -hmm. even against His own people. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yes. But God is God. He can do that. Of course. But also, that takes your own medicine. Oh, yeah. Yeah, basically, yeah. If you're right. acting evil. And you... Yeah. Yeah. But in the end, doesn't yeah. God judge those evil people that judge your people? Yeah. Absolutely. So, so he brings judgment on the people that judged you. Yes. Even though he sent them there to yeah. judge you. Yep. That's the wrath of God. Well, yeah. And we know even, that's where the second coming comes in, too, because he's going to right all the wrongs. Absolutely. Right? We, we, we know that. He's in the process of doing that, but we'll fully know that you know, at the second coming. Uh, but there, you know, there's a lot here. There's the idea of famine and fertility, right? What about, we skip the major phrase, I think, in verse 7. 
right in the middle of that verse, it says, because your sins are so many, and mm-hmm. what? Hostility is so great. Your hostility yeah. is great. The yeah. prophet, and, and it says the prophet is considered a fool. Yeah. The inspired man, a maniac, right? Yeah. Well, it's funny that you say that. We're, we're, we're in, uh, in Second Chronicles right now. You know, in the Ahab, Jehoshaphat era. And, and they, the, the, uh, they have a, Jehoshaphat wants a, he, they want, Ahab wants them to go to war against uh, Assyria with them. And, 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 and he said, and he, so he's got the 400 prophets there, yeah, and they're all yeah. telling him, yeah, 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 go for it, you can do it. And, and Jehoshaphat says, I need, I need, I want to speak, I want to see a prophet of God. And he says, well, I have one, but he never says anything good about me. I don't yeah. really like him. Yeah. You, you know, are you kidding? <laughs> yeah. And he brings him in, right? Right. And he brings him in and he prophesies a death. Right. Um, and then the king says, this is why I don't invite him. Right, exactly. <laughs> you, and you wonder why I don't want this guy, you know, at the party. And, and remember we talked about uh, a system that's dysfunctional, mm-hmm. right? A dysfunctional system, every system has problems. A family unit, you know, church. There's, what makes it dysfunctional is when there's problems identified and they're not dealt with. Correct. So here you have the prophet, this one prophet out of 400, uh, who wasn't afraid to speak the truth. Micaiah. Micaiah, that's it. Micaiah, and we looked at that at the beginning of, of the study. Uh, he wasn't afraid to speak the truth, and he knows by speaking the truth he was risking his own life, you know, uh, his own reputation, but it shows the hypocrisy and, and the irony of us selling out God. And that's what it uh, it, it boils down <coughs> to, right? We sell our souls. Right? Listen, you want to surround yourself with people who, who will tell you everything you're doing is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do we still do that today? Sure. sure, sure. Yeah. And along comes this, the... The man or the woman who says, oh, wait a minute, you know, let's take a look at this. That's why I don't like talking to you. Well, argue, argue with the word. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that's what it comes down to, right? Um, now, let's, let's look at God's response here, okay? Where are we? Uh, 16? Verse 15. Um, 15, if you will. Because of all their wickedness in... Gilgal. 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 I hated them there. Because of their sinful deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will no longer love them. All their leaders are rebellious. Ephron is blighted. Their roots is withered. They, they yield no fruit. Even if they bear children, I will slay their cherished offspring. My God will reject them because they have not obeyed him. They will be wanderers among the nations. Woe and Cain. Oh, what does that remind you of? Cain. Mm-hmm. Why? Because Cain didn't, didn't offer the proper sacrifice and he was sound of the way. Okay. And he wandered to the desert. He was a wanderer. Yeah. Well, so was God's people for a while, too, right? Because they disobedience. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So I see another hand up. Okay, I don't want to miss anybody. These are strong words. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not, right? Yeah. They're strong words. Yeah. My God will reject them because they have not obeyed. That's why I need confess, to confess to God about a hundred times a day. You know? Because it doesn't take very long for me to realize I've not obeyed them in some area. Right? Amen. Um, they will be wanderers among the nations. Sin always gives way to chaos. Amen. All right, that's another theme in the Bible, by the way. Sin always gives way to chaos. And when there's chaos, you're wandering, right? You don't know which way to turn. You don't know which way to go, right? My wife said that uh, <clears throat> the Hebrews journeyed 40 years in the desert because the men wouldn't ask for directions. <laughs> no, that's, that's not true, all right? <laughs> she got it. She got it. Yes. So, um, 
that leads to a disorder. Disorder. Chaos. Yeah. Disorder, which could never bring us anywhere near perfection, meaning completeness, wholeness. Yeah. And God is a God of perfection. Yeah, and also um, a God, of order. God is a God of order, right? He's a God of order. Uh, we can only make sense of this present evil age through the eyes of God and through his word. Otherwise, it's just chaos. Right. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. Right? And, I mean, th these are valuable lessons. Uh, otherwise, you, you watch the news, you, you get depressed within five minutes. Hmm. If they have, right? Yeah. Uh, you see the injustice going on around us. I mean, this injustice is all over the place. And it's fear. Yeah, it creates fear, it creates doubt. Um, but we have to start looking at the world through the eyes of God. And rather than getting negative about it, it should drive us to the Great Commission. Amen. Right? Mm -hmm. To go into our world and make disciples for Christ. That should be the driving force. Because then we know we're loving like God loves. Right? Rather than being the critics, you know, on the other side. Does that make sense? Right? Now, we're going to come to a portion here where God reveals that it's going to give them grace. They don't deserve it, but he's going to give them grace. All right? Let's, let's look at chapter 10 uh, again. Chip, if we can start with you. Sure. Um, if you can read the first, how many verses? The first five verses, and then Dan the next five, and then the next five. Okay. Israel was spreading Israel was a spreading vine he brought forth the fruit for himself as his fruit increased he built more altars and his land prospered he adorned the sacred stones their heart is deceitful and now they must bear their guilt the Lord will demolish their altars and destroy their sacred stones when they will say, we have no king because we did not revere the Lord. But even we had a king, even if we had a king, what could he do for us? They, made, they make many promises, take false oaths, and make agreements. Therefore lawsuits spring up like poisonous weeds in a plowed field. The people who live in Samaria feel uh, fear for the calf idol of Beth Aven. Its people will mourn over it, and so will its idolatrous priests, those who had rejoiced over its splendor, because it's taken from them, uh, taken from them into exile. It will be carried to Assyria as tribute for the great king. Ephraim will be disgraced. Israel will be ashamed of its wooden idols. Samaria and its king will float away like a twig on the surface of waters. The high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow up and cover their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us, and to the hills, fall on us. Since the days of Geba, you have sinned, O Israel, and there you have remained. Did not war overtake the Israel? evildoers of Geba. When I please, I will punish them. Nation will be gathered against them to put them in a bonds for their double sin. Okay. Next. Okay. Sure. sure. Ephron is a trained heifer that loves to spread. So I will put a yoke on her bare neck. I will drive Ephron Judah. Drive Ephron Judah. Must. Amen. Yes. Sorry. That's okay. Must plow, and Jacob must break up the ground. Sow yourselves in righteousness, reap the fruit of unfailing love, and break your unplowed ground, for it is time to seek the Lord, until he comes and showers righteousness on you. But you have planted wickedness, you have reaped evil, and you have eaten your fruit of deception, because you have depended on your own strength and on your many warriors. The war of battle will rise against your people so that all your fortresses will be devastated. As Shalman 
day is dated Beth Arbel on the day of battle, when mothers were dashed to the ground with their children. Keep on one more. One more verse. Thus it will happen to you, O Bethel, because your wickedness is great. When that day draws, the king of Israel will be completely destroyed. Good, thank you. What did you pick up in this chapter? There's some more themes here. Mitch, is that hand up? Yeah, verse 10. Uh, when I please, the Lord says, I will punish them and the nations will gather against them to put them in, a bond, in bonds for a double sin. Okay. All right, so here's a question to you. What are the two sins? They had a lot of idols. Okay. I'm looking at number six, and Israel had wooden idols, even though they were not supposed to make any idols. I mean, they just never learned. Okay, good. We're responsible about idolatrous priests. So it was the priest taking the lead and, and getting these idols mm -hmm. and, and making them. Good, all right. They wouldn't put their faith in God. Okay. You know, they wouldn't trust God for what they needed. You know, they, they, they just continually go to other resources. Okay. Number 13, when you have planted wickedness, you have wreaked evil. Even if you had eaten the fruit of deception, because you have depended on your own strength, mm -hmm. your own strength, on, on, on your many warriors. Okay. You, you guys are, are, are good. You're, you're all around it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get a little bit more particular. Whenever something is repeated, it's got to be important, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, the sin at Gibeah keeps coming up. Mm -hmm. As if to say you haven't learned your lesson yet, right? You still haven't repented of what happened at, Gib uh, at Gibeah. And, of course, then the second one is what Marie alluded to, their present infatuation with idols. Uh, they knew better. They knew better. Oh, yeah. So that's kind of the double sin here that's that's being looked at. Okay. Um, what is what is our tendency, humanly speaking? How how do we how do we sometimes deal with sin? Run away from it. We try to run away from it and deny deny it. Cover it up. Yeah. Rationalize it, rationalize it, right? We rationalize it, and I mean, Israel had. If there's any any way Israel could have justified sin, they they use all the ways available to them in their rebellion. And God, God is saying, "Do do what you want. It's not going to work." It's not gonna I think work. worst of all, they embraced it. Yeah. Uh, you know, which was which probably really angered them even more. Yeah. You know that they, they you know that they started believing that this is what they should be doing. Yeah. Yeah. When they knew better. When they knew better. Or should have known better. Either way. I'm gonna write a phrase on the board. Uh, I think it's a key phrase. Respect for the Lord. How does that play into this? You, you kind of see it in verse 4. The people make many promises, take false oaths, yes. make agreements, therefore lawsuits spring up like poisonous weeds in the, in the field. Uh, you remember in the law, uh, Jews weren't supposed to sue each other. Right? They, they were supposed to work it out, bring it to a judge, or, you know, but then they weren't supposed to sue each other. So here they are, they're, they're proceeding on disobeying God's word for their own personal gain, which shows a vast lack of respect for the Lord. Right? Because it would be like you telling your, uh, your child who just got their license. 
listen, you can use the car, but I want you to ask me before you use it. And they decide just to use it, mm -hmm. right? Well, whether they realize it or not, it shows a lack of respect for the parent. Is it, is it a true statement that a lot of times we treat God like that? You know? I mean, lack of respect here is, I think goes in hand, hand in hand with the term, the fear of the Lord, right? The fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is a healthy fear. It's not a, like, you know, a beginning of wisdom. He's going to get you, you know? It's a fear of saying, he's God, I'm not. He's holy, I'm not. And he's in charge, you know? He, right. he has the right to tell me what to do. Right, so you know, you pick some of that here. Um, I know we're running a little short on time, but I want to just complete this. There's there was another uh, phrase in here that should remind you of Revelation. Uh, where'd it go? I lost it for some reason. Um, what about the altars uh, in high places? And then we'll talk more about that. So he'll destroy the altars. Yeah, why do you think he'll destroy them? Because it's sin. Yeah, because they were used for sin. They were used for sin. There was a time where Israel did worship in the high places because they didn't have the, the temple yet or, or synagogue. So they would set up altars to God, you know, in high places. But those altars eventually were used for idol worship, right? Um, and in Revelation, doesn't it, aren't the people asking for the mountains to fall on them? That's too? it. Thank you, Marie. <laughs> Thank, read that, please. The high places of wickedness will be destroyed. It is the sin of Israel. Thorns and thistles will grow up and cover their altars. Then they will say to the mountains, cover us. And to the hills fall on us. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean that's almost word for word mm -hmm. yeah. in Revelation. Yes. When you say uh, worship idols, what exactly do you mean by, uh, what does that mean exactly? Idol, to give idol. your allegiance to something that takes away from your allegiance to God. Okay? Right. It could be good or bad. Do you have an example? Sure. Let's say... Let's say I came in here with a statue of of myself. <laughs> It'd be ugly, right? <laughs> a statue of myself, and I said, "You, you know, if you want God to bless you, you got to worship that statue. You know, forget about worshiping God, worship that statue." The golden bull. Yeah, yeah. Um, there could be good things that turn into idols. You know, I like sports, right? But if I stay home from church and and don't read what the scriptures and all because I I, I want to engage in sports, nothing wrong with sports, but anything that good or bad that pulls us well, away from God, God is an the, idol. The key word there is anything. Yeah, anything. Anything. Yeah, I mean, to some people, it's their cars. Yeah. House, their houses, house, their right? children, their children, right? Um, it, it, you know the. the uh, I'm getting lavender back there. <laughs> she said it. I did it. <laughs> so it's going this way, not that way. <laughs> well, it's three generations. Ago, yeah. Right? yeah. I'm not getting in the middle of that. I'm not getting in that. I found out Marie's always right. I so. learned a long time ago yeah. not to have your children, because I actually watched someone that I knew that was a friend and she always said that her son was her idol. Yeah. And I used to cringe when she said that. Yeah. And he wound up getting murdered. Yeah. And I, it was a, 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 a life lesson for me not to ever have anybody before God. Yeah. And that even applies in a husband wife relationship. God comes first. Uh, yeah, God comes first. All right? Because if we in a husband I hate the word soulmate. I hate that word. And the reason why I hate that word is the only one who can satisfy your soul is Jesus Christ. Right? 
when when two people unite in marriage, we both have strengths and weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And we're going to disappoint one another because we're still sinners, right? It's only Christ who can satisfy totally. And that's where our identity should be, in Christ. Mm -hmm. In him, we're secure. And in him, we're significant. Our life counts mm -hmm. for something. So, yeah, John, you had something yes. else? Yes, okay. in, in, in verse 1, I just wanted to point out that this implies, it says, Israel was spreading volume. He brought forth fruit for himself. So it, it, it's saying that they were doing good. Yeah. They, they were prosperous. They were all eating good. Everything was good. As his fruits increased, he built more altars. As his land prospered, he adorned his sacred stones. The, 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 the better off they, the, the, the more they felt, the more affluent they felt and, 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 and blessed, the farther they got from God. Right. The less they needed God. That's what I meant to yeah. say. The less they needed God. Yeah. And, the, and the more they went, you know, they went to the left. And that's when we hear phrases, look what I did. You're right. right? Look what I did. No, look at God's grace in your life. This is, you know, that's a totally different perspective. He blessed you with that gift in order to do that. So, yeah, that's yeah. good God. Yeah. I mean, the moment we start taking credit for accomplishments, uh, listen, we, you know, you work hard. There's no, no taking away from that. But anything that we do, we're supposed to do with excellence unto the Lord. So that means we give him the glory. Always. Yeah, yeah. We give him and the glory. And he's a jealous yeah. guy. I had a question. Um, what actually is a sin at, uh, at Gebeah? Because I was, the sin at Gebeah, what Specifically, is there a specific sin? Wait, say that again. Senator Gabea. What is the Senator Gabea? Yeah, what's the Senator Gabea? Oh, they, they killed the uh, concubines of the priests. Okay, thank you. There. Okay. It was, a, it was a big massacre, as a matter of fact. Okay. Horrible. Do you know where that's in scripture? Uh, I did, and I didn't write it down. <laughs> okay, I'll look it up. Thank you. All right. It was actually uh, Gibeah and Gil uh, Gilgal. Uh, first, you yeah. look up both of them. Talking about the double sin. Double sin. All right, here's, here's your assignment for next week. All right. I want you to read chapters 11 and 12. All right, they're fairly short. Remember, I had you come up with the big idea as if you were going to teach it or preach it? Come up with the big idea in three words. Well, no, uh, that's unfair. Come up with the big idea in one sentence, okay? And then in another sentence, the big idea of, of each chapter. All right? That's 10 and 11? Uh, 11 and 12. 11. So wait, a big idea for 11 and 12, 12. and then a big idea for 11 and, and a big 12. idea for 12. 12. Now they, they they could overlap, okay? So they got the effort for both chapters and what was the second one? Individually. Uh, oh, you want individually? Collectively and individually. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Collectively, very good. <laughs> right. Or as we say in a legal complaint, uh, oh, how do we jointly and severally? <laughs> <laughs> can, I, can I ask a probably a simple <laughs> question? No, sorry. Um, why is the pronoun for Israel he and the pronoun for Ephraim she? Is that a, is there a biblical explanation or is that just a convention of... No, it's a good question. Um, my guess would be Israel is the nation and Ephraim is the town I, you know, under Israel. That would be my guess, but I, that's a good question. I have to look it up. All right. Unless... Rob no, I don't, I, don't, I don't think there's anything significant about it. It's just a reference. Yeah, yeah. Just, I don't think there's anything significant about it. I wouldn't think so. Yeah. All right. So you want a, a good idea in one sentence for 11 and 12. Yes. Yeah. And then separate yeah, ideas for both sentences. Yeah, yeah. Like, okay. you know, preachers struggle over how to title their message. Right? And they, they usually come up with a, a short title. 
for instance, I appreciate the, the woman at the well today and how she responded. Uh, and I entitled the message Holy Gossip. Okay? So, just stuff like that. All righty. Um, I, I put this on. I didn't hand these out to you because if I hand them out to you, you'll lose them for next in September, and then I'll have to re, re, redo them. But this is this is the synoptic gospel class. We're gonna, oh. I'm going I'm to teach the synoptic gospel class. Oh, cool. So this is see this little chart here. Yes. You'll understand. You'll understand this chart once we get done with everything. Okay. Can you post that on the website? Uh, I guess I could. I guess I could. I guess I could. All right, I think that's it right now. We got we got two more weeks left, right? Uh, uh, it's three. 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 All right, everybody. Thank Thanks for coming. Thanks Thank for you. church so, being four hours long for many of you. Didn't see him like this. Okay. Get ready for Easter.